some of our best people are working on this, uh, I don't know how far they'll get. It's a great question, isn't it? We talked about this the other day. You know, is the brain uh, the repository of consciousness, or is it like an, a TV antenna? Seeking consciousness in the brain may be like seeking little men in the radio. Uh, it's And the problem of memory... Where was it? Uh, we had that whole discussion about memory, and then in the New York Times, there was a whole article about uh, molecular theories of memory and what a big bust it was and how they hadn't really gotten uh, anywhere. Oh, I know what it was about. It was about the silent areas of the genome. Remember how we talked about how only 5% of the DNA transcripts protein and the other 95% is what's called trash DNA, except that it appears to be very necessary and no one knows why, and then how this was a possible storage site uh, for memory. But, but I, I don't know. I mean, it may require technologies we can't even imagine to correctly model memory. They're now talking about what are called terabyte storage modules, which would uh, be crystals, basically led, uh, read by the um, intersection of very, very fine laser beams that when they, inter they could intersect at any of a very large number of points in this, in this terabyte cube, and each of these possible points is a zero or a one. And so you have a, a very, very dense storage potential. But, you know, we have a way to go. There are nine billion genes, in, approximately, in most higher mammals, and you can, you can get that easily on the head of a pin, easily on the head of a pin. So nature as, as model for nanotechnological storage of information, we, we still have a way to go with all of that. <laughs> well, um, we can talk about this or not talk about it. Anybody have anything they want to take off from on this? It's a big subject. It's nebulous. The paradigm changes everything, you see. And the paradigms now come out of science. How we view nature determines how we view ourselves, how we plan our societies, um, and how we relate to the past. What you said about creos, when you came like habit creos, that kind of falling into this rut and just continuing to channel along through it, is, is the process that we've been basically going through. And as new ideas are spawned, new things, little pieces of novelty erupt along the path, we can find new ways to jump out of our tracks and join in with other tracks and perhaps create new habit patterns for others to form on. And I, I'm fascinated by it. I'm fascinated by the feeling of it, the energy I got from what you were saying, and the sense that but then it's really just a matter of continually zinging out new ideas that's going to change us or transition us, rather what like Sheldrake was talking about. Once you've gone the maze, once you run the maze, everybody else is going to run the maze that much better. So each idea that you spawn, each idea that somebody spawns, is actually helping to make it so that it's going to continue to happen Yeah, well, we've talked here, not this year, but last year, about, about memes. You know what memes are? Memes are the smallest units of a concept. And they're like genes. The word is deliberately constructed to, re to rhyme with gene. And so when I say every woman should have consider having only one child, that's a meme. And that meme goes out into society where it competes with the family values meme, the gay lifestyle meme, the celibacy meme. They all compete like animals in an environment, an environment of information. And then uh, some win and some lose. You know, like the meme of the 18-child family is not doing too well these days. Yet in 1800, the average American woman gave birth 13 times in her life. 
the average American. So memes, memes come and go, and then and they compete sometimes fairly with each other, sometimes not. I mean, a bad meme can gain ascendancy if you artificially enhance it by spending money. You hire a publicist, and then they say a bad idea is a good idea, and then the bad idea gains a certain coherency. So, uh, yes, and under the influence of technological innovation and psychedelic drugs and cultural pluralism and all these things, uh, more and more memes are being generated and released. Uh, you know, forms of, like, shamanism is a meme. The I Ching is a meme. Yoga is a meme. Uh, Chinese herbal medicine is another meme. And these things just furiously compete. Uh, and the ones with the, the most effective memes, whatever that means, always this mystery, the survival of the fittest, and then whoever survives you call the fittest, uh, but it is, it's forcing mutation of these very rigid, linear, post-Renaissance uh, structures that have been put in place in Europe and derivative civilizations without ever being subjected to serious competition from uh, other, other times and places. So that's part of what's driving us forward into the future. And the other thing is simply the availability of information. That this is the age when all secrets were told or they are being told. I mean, the, the, uh, you know, if you're a standard user of the Internet, you actually know more about what's going on in the world than probably the director of the Central Intelligence Agency 15 years ago. You know, 15 years ago, that guy, he had the secret reports, the agents in the field, the, what do they call them, the national projections on every country and, and so forth. Well, now you have all that and you're, you know, the democratization of information is a, a very interesting phenomenon. And it tends, I think, to replace freedom and law with novelty and habit. One of the great things about the internet is how difficult it is to regulate it. How it's, uh, it's uh, you know, almost beyond anticipation. It's as big as the human imagination. So we've created a technology, unlike electricity, which we can control, that perhaps we cannot potentially control. The internet. Well, I don't think we've ever controlled a technology. This is what McLuhan is all we about. We did and sold it, is what I mean. Or educated us to, you know, be a part of that. We recognized that we controlled Well, like, but in every technology carries utterly unpredictable consequences. I mean, nobody dreamed, you know, that the automobile would create a sexual revolution because it's a rolling bedroom. <laughs> Nobody dreamed that the automobile would destroy the extended family. The people would move hundreds and hundreds of miles from uh, the automobile created the suburb. And, you know, McLuhan on print, he says that the linear uniform qualities of print created the very possibility of science of the idea of ordered nature. Before the printed book, nobody demanded that nature be ordered. I mean, it was nice to be able to predict the movement of the stars, but the idea that the precision of, of stellar movement could be extended down to the oceans and the, and the animal life, that's a, that's a, a post-Cartesian ideal for sure. He, McLuhan, said that the citizen is a creation of print. The public is a creation of print. There was no public in the Middle Ages. You don't have a public unless you have books or their derivatives. Uh, the idea of uh, audience, you know, these things that are so uh, basic to us, the idea of interchangeable parts in the manufacture of all kinds of objects, that's from print. Um, so forth and so on. Similarly, television had hidden, 
hidden impacts on sensory ratios. McLuhan, strangely, his interpretation of television was that it restored us to a medieval sensory ratio. He said that, that print was an, an ear culture and that uh, television is an eye culture, that uh, he believed the TV screen was more like a page of medieval manuscript than either was like a printed book, because he said in the case of the TV screen and the medieval manuscript, you must look. You must look. In the case of the book, you do not look. You read. And reading is a completely different function than looking and creates different ratios in the senses. You know, the emergence of the laws of perspective in the, in the late, uh, in, the, in the 1460s must have burst over the consciousness of European humanity like a paradigm change. When they first began doing perspective, they sold, sold, manufactured for the art schools in Italy these things called perspectographs that would project a recessional grid onto a canvas so people could learn how to do it. Well, we do it absolutely unconsciously. I mean, for us, the laws of perspective are a fact of nature, and yet they were discovered by an advanced group of thinkers less than 500 years ago. That's odd. What do you mean by, um, this, I mean, you mean the laws of perspective, like the things farthest away from you appear smaller? Right, <laughs> that was the breakthrough. <laughs> So he said, gee, I never noticed that quite before. You're right. <laughs> and, you know, someone like Piaget has studied this phenomenon and in the development of the drawing styles of young children and believes then that a child uh, essentially in the spirit of the old saw that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, the child develops through these cultural phases. You know, from the iconic hieroglyphic to the flattened, uh, I can't remember the art historical term, but and then, lo and behold, the perspective locks in and the child can see. Is that to say that kids who draw in the the pre, you know, before they realize about perspective are not seeing perspective? That's the assumption. So let me see if I did my list. Uh, I didn't say transcending the calculus, but it's down here. But I think we flayed the history of mathematics and uh, well yeah it's interesting how theology is going to show up in all this mix because um, you've, me you've mentioned all these various uh, disciplines ways of seeing you know and I'm curious if whether we're going to start to create a, a you can say a paradigm that is not theological so much but a way of seeing the world as using the word spiritual Okay, using that word and attempting to somehow see the world in that light with, you know, this uh, new way of seeing, this new way of... I'm well, curious how that will translate itself. The freedom and law bit, the god of that universe is the, cla is the blind watchmaker, you know, who made the universe, who set it going, and who went to some to Idaho or something. The god of the habit and novelty world is, is Gaian. Everything is pictured organismically. Everything is pictured as subsets, fractal subsets of other things. Uh, it's, and, and, and I think that that Gaian god, Des, will empower feeling that the blind watchmaker doesn't. I mean, the, the only hope in Christianity, and it's a kind of a footnote, is that the blind watchmaker will someday return or send a representative, and then that'll be good. But in the meantime, you are just 
shit out of luck. Uh, you have to sort it out on your own, you know. Um, the the Gaian thing is a, is more um, congruent with uh, the way agricultural and Aboriginal peoples all over the world have always imaged nature. It's a curious thing, the Western commitment to abstraction. It's a unique cultural set. Uh, you know, if you are at all familiar with the Maya civilization, they achieved great things in mathematics and in technical understanding of city planning and coordination of large-scale tasks and, and this sort of thing. But they never left the woods in a certain sense. Their buildings are adorned with floral ornament. They, they remain shamans through the high classic. They uh, remain bound by huge public ritual and spectacle and this sort of thing. And Western civilization, this freedom thing, and then this God who went away and abandoned us, the blind watchmaker, this all set us up for an entirely different kind of cultural style. And I don't judge it. I mean, I think the accomplishments of Western civilization stagger the mind, but they are like... It's like a mad child. You know, the toys created by the mad child of Western civilization should clearly be turned over to mum for uh, checkout and application because uh, uh, left in the service of the childish worldview of Western civilization, these things are just tools for polluting the environment, decimating the cities of your enemies, so forth and so on. I mean, so we've outgrown the technologies that have so well served us. Yeah, I think it's very clear that technology has become a demon, right. that probably the moment is you know, when the first atomic pile was lit. Right. And certainly at Alamogordo, I mean, Fermi was appalled. He said, you know, this is a dark moment for the human race. Uh, in spite of the fact that it meant the end of fascism and all that, on a scale of a hundred, a thousand years, it meant the genie was out of the bottle. Never again would human beings live without the power to wreck the planet. Well, so that's enough of that. Anybody want to say anything, or shall we pack it in here today? You can turn it any way you like, um, but I, I think it's interesting because there's been a lot of talk over the years about the new paradigm, and there have been small paradigms which have claimed to be it, and, and, and old wine in new bottles that's claimed to be it, but it's, it, it's going to come from a re-examination of time and the whole idea of temporal invariance and of mathematical modeling of nature through the techniques derivative of the calculus. It isn't going to be that way anymore. What these fractal and chaos theory and complexity theory models represent is the first steps beyond the objects of Greek mathematics in 2500 years. I mean, you know, we've been using the perfect circle, the perfect cube, the dodecahedron. All of calculus is based on the ellipses that can be sectioned from a cone. And uh, now suddenly, new, entirely new strides. And it, it's a huge revolution. I mean, it, it's very hard to get it all in focus, what, what this all means. We were very fortunate to live through an age of enormous reappraisal. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you want to say something? <laughs> Actually, I, I was sitting where David was sitting the other day, and we talked a little bit afterwards. I don't know if he's had a chance to talk with you. David said. Gelman? Yeah. No, we haven't talked. Well, he brought up something about um, the shaman, the, the artist, the magician, the, the sense of the other ways to accomplish some of the same goals, perhaps, that science is getting 
going towards, and, and obviously the, the roots seem to be converging more, I think, than, than diverging. And, and I'm just curious, at the time when he talked to you, or asked, brought up the question, you sort of talked on it a little bit, but it changed when we spoke afterwards. He said, oh, I wanted to talk more. I was hoping we'd get back into the thing. About shamanism and art and was, magic? Yeah, the, the sense of what, what um, I guess, the goals and the way they come through. And I know you think on more than just the level of science. Yeah, I'm a critic of science. I mean, I think it, it, uh, it's an interesting artifact but it shouldn't, you know, it's become a tyrant. It's become the arbiter of all truth. And that's ridiculous. I mean, that's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, most of what's interesting doesn't fall under the purvey of science. Well, shamanism and the modern echo of it in the artist is this um, awareness. It's a humbler position. Because what shamanism is saying is that ultimately art is the best you can do. And science is, has a Faustian dynamic. It dreams of a kind of ultimate resolution. They're even talking in here about uh, Leibniz said, in the least of substances, eyes as piercing as those of God could read the whole course of the universe. That's what science wants. Eyes as piercing as those of God. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the shaman acts to ameliorate our condition. I mean, we are meat. We are suspended between, you know, that vagina and grave. It's all up for grabs. Uh, humor is an admission of ignorance. Ignorance is the precondition for knowledge. Uh, M magic uh, and in a sense you know to take it to a deeper level magic is a deeper perception than science because science believes that the world is truly there mm -hmm. it is naive in its empiricism magic knows that the world is made of language that the world is a construct of, the f of forceful imagination and, uh, you know, the people who don't know this are walking around inside the realities created by the people who do. The Madison Avenue understands this. Government propaganda agencies fully understand this. And to the degree that you empower yourself, you will become more and more a dweller in linguistic constructs of your own making. This is what I meant. This is a good closure. This is what I meant by do not watch, do not consume. In other words, do not lease other people's linguistic structures and live in them. Build your own virtual Worlds build your own values and your own house of mirrors, and and uh, and then you know you are on equal footing. But if you are consuming the manufactured linguistic structures, Marxism, Freudianism, Christianity, Keynesian economics, you name it, uh, then uh, you are uh, you are to a degree giving up your your humanness, your uniqueness. That's, you know, and in Buddhist philosophy, this is, this is a value greatly to be conserved. Human uniqueness. And I don't think any culture in history has been so at war with human uniqueness because we have the technology to export so many so-called pat answers. No matter what your problem is, there's a book and a self-help group for you. Well, that's not... No, no, no. That isn't it at all. Uh, you know, build your own damn wagon. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Enough of this. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.